Hello. Well, it looks like there are three of us here, and we'll get started. And for those who may be watching this at a later date, I'd like to welcome you to the first book club uh, session of this season. We will have four sessions this year. Um, my name is Drina Nemes. I'm the host of this book club for tonight. And uh, I'd like to welcome Michelle, who's here, and Betsy. And just to say that uh, book club started about a year ago, September of 2020, uh, by Gloria Ferris and Betsy O'Hagan. And they put together uh, a series of book clubs so that during the pandemic, there would be some very interesting discussions and presentations and people could have an opportunity to expand their, their reading and book knowledge. So the book we are talking about tonight is called Where the World Ends by Geraldine McCochran. And fortunately, I found someone who wrote out the pronunciation of her name so I could get it a little bit better than before knowing what that was. So it's McCochran. And uh, this was suggested by, we believe, a uh, member of the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, Paula Lozano, to Gloria. And I want to thank Paula and Gloria then for this choice because I found it to be an excellent, excellent read historical nonfiction, and so um, I thought maybe we could just start with a little bit of an introduction and um, how you came across Where the World Ends, but I think that's evident here because all three of us are with the Cuyahoga Audubon Society. So um, let's just start then as a discussion um, then Michelle, if I could ask you, um, what did you think of Where the World Ends? Oh, I, I really enjoyed this book. I um, purchased it right before I went on vacation, and so I, I had it to read on the flight down to Los Cabos and then finished up poolside there. Um, it, it was a really good read. It really helped the, the plane ride pass quickly for me. <laughs> um, and what I found, I guess the, the comment that I want to make is when I, when I went on vacation, I went without my husband and my kids. It was with my mom and some other family members. And just reading about these poor boys strapped, or trapped on the stack, I, just, I was so sad to be away from my boys. I just wanted to give them a hug <laughs> to read uh -huh. the book. Um, and especially when, and I don't know, are we allowed to talk about details? Are we assuming that everyone's read it? We're not going to give, give spoilers away? I think we can go ahead and discuss it. Okay, um, okay. So when little Davy passes away, that was a really hard moment. Um, it's probably for everyone who read the book. Um, and then at the very end when you're reading Geraldine's uh comments about the story and how you know, none of the boys were reported to have died. And I was like, well, then why did you make one die? <laughs> but it really does make for a better story. So I understand, you know, you get so emotionally attached to all these characters and you know, their personalities and uh, to, to have one perish really, really um, portrays the, the hardship and the peril that these boys were in the entire time that they were trapped on the stack. Mm -hmm. I found uh, this book to be just so engaging from the very first chapter on in terms of wanting to know more about these characters and then feeling attached to them and then feeling in many ways such an emotional uh, attachment to them as the story goes on and kind of motherly too you know as though for the boys at least I found the adult characters a little bit more distant but um, as soon as we start finding out that 
the boat hasn't isn't coming back. It hasn't come back yet, and they don't know what's happening. The emotional charge of that situation of not knowing, uh, I felt that so, so deeply. And it must be the way the author <laughs> writes it, you know, that that kind of an attachment uh, grew so deeply. Um, I found that I really had so much admiration for a lot of the characters, especially Quilliam, who seemed uh, just a remarkable young man. Um, he was brilliant in his ability to be able to um, deal with his own emotions while also helping to manage the emotions of, ever, of especially the little ones. But he was such a, an emotionally stable and turned out to be their, a leader for all of them. And he felt things so deeply. And uh, his, his uh, talk about Merdina, um, you could tell, you know, that he, that this was a new experience for him. If he's, I'm not sure how old he actually was, 14 or 15 or around there, maybe a little, I'm not sure about younger, but he certainly uh, found out what it's like to have what he called disturbing, disturbing feelings. Um, so she, um, it's historical fiction as, as she has said, and, uh, she, she really is in a way had freedom to then develop the whole story and to be able to be so creative about their activities and what they, what they, um, what they were doing there the whole nine months that they were there. Um, she seemed to have such a knowledge of what it would be like to be a fowler and to catch the birds and keep them and store them and how they did it and how they navigated on the stacks. Um, did you have a favorite character? Um, yeah, well, my favorite character was Quilliam, you know, the, the main character. Um, like you said, I, I, you know, I also had such admiration for him at his young age. I thought he was a little younger, but like maybe 12, but I, I, I don't know. Maybe that's just where I was kind of seeing him. Um, but having such an in-depth view of life at his yeah. young age, especially since it becomes apparent uh, just through the author's writing that education isn't highly valued where in their community it seems like it's it, it's more i mean they do have school but they're expected to work more um at least that that's what i got from it that it's it's you know they, they take them out of school they, they send them to work um but just that he has such insight anyways and, and part of that is probably due to, to mardina um that that young woman that that he ended up falling in love with and her influence and her focus, she was very educated. She came from the mainland and was very educated and taught them and shared stories. And, um, you know, perhaps that that really helped Quilliam to to explore that part of himself. Um, but yeah. even, yeah, but even so, j just the way that he became a rock for the younger kids um, who were also trapped on the stack and, uh, just the inventive, he was so inventive, what, you know, the, the things that he, he made up to help ground the kids, uh, giving them, um, what did they, sorry, it's been a month since I read it, but they're, they, they were in charge of something specific, like each one had a task and something that they owned, and that was just brilliant. It was. Yeah. Yeah. They were the keepers. That's right, the keepers, thank you. Yes. He was also a good storyteller and was able to grasp their attention. And uh, I think that was another one of his many gifts. And then also with Mr. Ferris, 
when Mr. Ferris was about to commit suicide and uh, Quilliam was able to, you know, really get them both into such a position hanging over the cliff um, and able to convince Mr. Ferris, I think, that if he did commit suicide, it would be a great wickedness and thereby kind of convince Mr. Ferris not to kill himself. Um, so he really, Quilliam was really quite remarkable. Um, I, I put together some slides, Michelle, because uh, I thought she did a, a great job with the birds. And as, uh, did you see the letter that uh, she wrote to me? I did. That was fantastic. Yeah. How wonderful that she responded and it was insightful as to her story. Yeah. And she uh, basically said that she, um, she likes birds, but that she depended upon the research of someone else. But she surely seemed to really get it, what these birds are like, like their natural history and how that feeds into the story. Um, so I guess, Bet, um, Betsy, maybe we could go ahead with the slides. So you're familiar with this, Michelle. It's our, it was a basic uh, introduction to our book club here and talking about our, uh, how you could access the Free Conference Center, our platform, and registrations and courage and where to get the book. Next slide. So here's a picture of Geraldine McCochran and uh, she received a very prestigious English uh, award, the Carnegie Medal, for the, Where the World Ends. She got that in 2018 and then she also had received it in 1998 for a book called A Pack of Lies. And in reading a little bit about her, uh, she's written many books and uh, she seems to be very well uh, established and, and liked in Great Britain. Next slide. So uh, I had, I thought, why don't I just look on YouTube and see a little bit and also with uh, on pictures, looking for pictures of these warrior, of the warrior stack, the ones that they stay. And there are some YouTube videos where people are traveling to the, the warrior stack and the other stacks, which are these uh, outcroppings, they call them stacks. And they're quite remarkable. And these pictures I don't think do justice to their uh, enormity and majesty. But I, I hope these pictures show and convey really, uh, really like the extent of the rockiness of these. And for these nine people or 12 people to be on this for nine months, uh, you know, no vegetation, no trees, of course, um, covered with birds in the, in the, appropriate times of the seasons, but uh, the, especially to me, the picture on the, on the left shows how looming and kind of dark and dangerous the, this landscape is. Uh, next slide. So she, um, I think there were eight birds in total that she used uh, throughout the book and I wasn't familiar with some of the terms that she used. For example, a baby gannet is a guga. Did you know that, Michelle? No, I did not. Yes. Not until I read the, yeah, and started looking yeah. at these. Yeah. And uh, from the comments in the book, uh, gannets can dive 100 kilometers per hour into the sea thanks to nostrils that are in their mouths 
and, a, and their face and chest are padded with air pockets. Uh, and their eyes are very good at judging distances. Uh, their genus name is Morus, M-O-R-U-S, meaning stupid, uh, because they are so easy to kill. Then the Gugas, the, the chicks, uh, they hatch from very big, tough eggs and grow fat and fluffy very fast, and then they molt. And their meat was once prized as a delicacy. And then we have the great auk, uh, which they call a garfowl, and it really took on some magical qualities in the book. And this is extinct, unfortunately. And it seemed like uh, the last of uh, this great auk was, um, they were killed uh, in about the 1840s. But um, they're related to penguins. So it's um, just kind of very sad. But it was uh, in the book, the great auk is really uh, kind of a character that seems to help uh, Quilliam at the time and um, a magical bird. So this is a picture of it from um, a Natural History Museum in England, in London. Next slide. Okay, then she uh, has some discussion of the fulmar, and the fulmars, just I was getting a closer look at that beak, and that beak is really quite remarkable. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, these birds are, can glide and bank and ride the updrafts in front of the seaside cliffs. It's an elegant and stylish flyer, but if threatened, it spits out the oily, smelly contents of its stomach. So, uh, next slide. And then there's the storm petrel. And wasn't that amazing to hear about how these birds were actually used, that they had wicks put in them so they could be used as candle, and then they're so oily, full of oil, that they're able to burn. And it sounds gruesome, too, but uh, can see how people could benefit. It would be so important to have a source of light and a source of fire and then hot food. So the petrel, uh, it's a kind of a um, fulmar, and uh, they feed at the sea's surface, and it looks as though they're able to walk on water, which give them, gives them the name of St. Peter. Um, in storms, they'll shelter on the lee side of the ship. And there were superstitious um, superstitions about them. For example, that if you saw a storm petrel, it means that a bad storm was coming. Then we have the puffins. And apparently, they served as such a, a huge source of food for, of course, these people on the on the stack while they were there for nine months. Uh, puffins in flight, these small pretty ox beat their wings 400 times. Um, oh, I can't read my writing. It can't be 400 times a minute, I don't think. But they rest in rock crevices or uh, in soil burrows. And then they shed their beaks after the breeding season, which I was surprised at. Okay, next slide. And then we have the great black back gull, which probably you've seen this. Um, Michelle, have you seen this in real person? 
in real life? Um, I I don't believe so. Yeah. I know because I they, think they're here. They do come here. I think we have locally the ring build goal and the herring are the two I think most um, prominent. But I I do believe the blackback does come here. I just have I'm not a goal watcher. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've not so seen I it haven't here. seen it. Okay. I've oh, and I did. It. If I may interrupt, I'm sorry. I did. You were correct. Your handwriting was fine. It is 400 times a minute on the pocket. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, now it sounds unbelievable. Yeah. It sounds like a little close to a hummingbird. But well, um, I have seen black the great black back gulls uh, even at Rocky River Park. Okay. But at uh, I put a picture in here too to try to show relatively. You know, there's the their size compared to other gulls, and because they do stand out, they're so big. Um, but in this book, she talks about them as how aggressive they are and how they would, you know, they were like um, pecking, pecking at the at the boys. And I just don't know that about the great black backed gulls' behavior. I was surprised and interested to hear about that. Um, okay, and then the next slide. So, um, Shearwater and another um, of the, the birds that she describes, they've been known to live for 50 years um, after uh, often uh, nesting underground. They produce an eerie sound, an eerie music. And then the Guillemot, um, you can see here how black and white it is. Um, in the winter, it's white. But it has these unbelievably orange-red feet. Um, and they spend most of their, uh, their time at sea flying. But on the bird calendar, they're the first to return um, after winter. And that was... Uh, Part of the way she used it in the story with the Guillemots coming back in uh, late winter, and it allowed the people, uh, the the people marooned, the boys and the men, to realize that they were further along in the season. There was the light days were longer. The Guillemots came back, and so they were much further ahead in their timetable than. Uh, than they had thought they had lost track of time. So those were um, those were the birds that she used in this, and she had her source from uh, an ornithologist in Scotland. And uh, in that letter, if you saw it, his web, she mentioned his name, John Love, and his website. I took a look at it and. It was very interesting, and I'll probably go back and look at it again. But I thought the way she used the birds for the whole story, of course, that's why they were all there, was for fowling, was really remarkable because she was able to figure out so many things about uh, how the birds, how they lived and how it fit in with the story. Um, so that's about all I had for tonight uh, in terms of, you know, looking at the slides and discussion and um, anything else that you would like to say? I just um, think it was really interesting from the author's letter to you um, how important it was for the publishing company to make sure that this historical fiction was indeed historically accurate. Yes. And oh, so yeah. I, I really enjoyed hearing that, that, you know, um, you know, she had to change some of the characters' names because, oh, boys at that time from that island wouldn't have had a name like that. So, she, you know, so it was really interesting. I think she did, she did say she kept Quilliam. She was able to keep the main character's name, the one she had chosen, uh, but also that these birds, like you were mentioning, how they live, their behavior, all of that is accurate. And it was it was good 
good to to hear that and to know that, and I appreciate the story more um, knowing that about it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, her research, her ability to use the research and and weave it into her story. Uh, one other question I thought I'd I'd ask is what did you think of the situation with John? The boy who was not a boy. Oh, thank you. So I'm like, who was that? <laughs> <laughs> that was really interesting. Um, and and <laughs> I I thought that I, I, it was just it was it was a, a a really interesting dynamic to see played out um i'm glad that she had friends who loved her and accepted her even though she was a girl you know she wasn't one of their own you know a, another boy um and that tried to protect her um there, there was a character in this book that tried to take advantage of her. Well, took advantage of everybody, you know, making himself like the, the head, um, the priest or, or whatever he was calling himself, the, the religious figure, and uh, tried to take advantage of her. And I, I'm glad that you know she was saved from that, but she also saved herself from that. So that was kind of cool to see. I mean, she's big and strong, and um, she was able to fend for herself. And I, I like seeing that strong female character, but also glad to see that she was still accepted among the boys once the truth was found out about her. Yeah. It was really kind of a brilliant uh, mm -hmm. a brilliant idea on the part of the author to do that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then um, the character Murdo, who had sisters and who he knew something about women having their monthly cycles. Mm -hmm. So he was able to help uh, Quilliam, I think, understand what was going on, too. And uh, so very interesting and dynamic. Uh, and, and that is that was kind of a funny part. That, well, not funny, a sad funny that she had to learn about that from a boy. Yeah. <laughs> one, of yeah. her, one of her friends. Like she had yeah. she was taught nothing um, just because her, her father had had girls, 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 and wanted a boy <laughs> or something yeah. like that. Like, just wanted, wanted her to be a boy so bad that they raised her as a boy, and she knew nothing about mm -hmm. what to expect of her, her coming mm -hmm. of age. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh. Well, um, the next slide, I think, is our uh, just looking ahead to the next uh, book club, which will be uh, January 25th when we will talk about Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And I'm looking forward to that. I have not read it before, but it seems like a, it, it, it is a classic for the environmental movement. So thank you for being here, Michelle. Thank you, Betsy. Well, thank you for, for um, running this program. And I, I really enjoyed uh, Where the World Ends. And I, I can't wait to read Silent Spring and attend the next one. Okay. Thanks.